Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am a minute early. My name is Jess. And uh, you guys will be able to see my face the entire time that we'll be presenting today. I may be able to uh, tune in and out a little bit, and I may be adjusting my camera here and there. Um, but I did want to pop in, say hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're talking about our American beaver. Thank you so much. Um, it's two o'clock. We're going to uh, get started with just a couple ground rules. Um, like I said, my name is Jess Brooks. I work for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. I'm the Southern Region Wildlife Education Coordinator here in Las Vegas. And I do have some help with me today. I have a moderator, her name is Nicole. She will not be popping in. However, she will be answering some questions that you guys have. Um, there is a Q&A box either at the top or the bottom of your screen that if you click on it, you can type in a question and Miss Nicole will be answering them throughout the entire presentation. I won't be able to see them until the very end. Um, we also have a chat box um, that is disabled at the moment, but as we progress through the presentation, I'll be um, putting out some questions to you guys just to see if you guys know the answers. Um, they're gonna be pretty fun. Um, I just wanted to have the ability to have everyone involved. So um, uh, yeah, as we, as we go through the presentation, I can open up the chat and then anyone can type in an answer and I will be able to see those. Um, last but not least, this is a PG rated presentation. This is appropriate for all, um, all family, um, so I just wanted to remind everyone to please keep your, um, your questions appropriate, your chats appropriate, or we have the ability to uh, make you leave. Um, we don't want to do that, so. Okay, going in. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Today we're talking about our North American beaver. My name is Jess Brooks, and um, the very first thing I wanted to talk with you guys about is what we are gonna be discovering today about our beaver. So very first, beaver are the only mammals that other humans and that um, other than humans build homes and communities by investing time and energy to cut down trees. We do that, there's really no other animal that does that. Today we'll be talking about um, some fascinating facts about beaver learn where they come from, why we're here, or why they are here. We're going to um, discuss why they're so successful, some special um, anatomy qualities, some life history, and looking into the future of our beaver. So what is it about beavers that we are so drawn to? Um, this is something that I want everyone to kind of think about on their own and also what do we think about or what do we feel when we see beaver. A lot of times when I tell people that we do have beaver in the southern part of the state or even in the northern part of the state, um, they look at me in disbelief. We do have beaver. Uh, we have beaver in the southern region all over Lake Mead, um, even the Clark County Wetlands Park. We do have a lot of beaver here. They're really not thought of to be an animal living in the Mojave Desert. Uh, we do have beaver also in the northern part of the state as well, but um, people often think, oh, we don't have beaver, but we absolutely do. And then lastly, I want you guys to think about, um, have you ever built something that you are proud of? Obviously, beaver are wonderful builders. We're going to be looking at the things that they build for themselves and their families. Um, did you know a beaver's teeth are orange? And this is my very first question to you guys in the chat. I'm going to open it up right now. Um, I want to see if you can tell me why a beaver's teeth are orange. Um, I do have a picture right here um, at the bottom of your screen, a beaver very uh, kindly smiling at the camera. But um, can anyone tell me why a beaver's teeth are orange? I have opened up the chat, so go for it. You can type in your answers and I can see them. So I'm gonna give you just a couple of seconds to do that. Okay, I do see some answers coming through. Um, 
Thank you for being honest. A couple of people said no idea. That's totally okay. Some people are seeing from eating trees, from the sap in the tree. That's a great guess because they never stop growing. That is true, Matthew. Beaver's teeth and rodent teeth never ever stop growing. They grow and grow and grow forever. But that's not the reason why they're orange. They're orange. Yeah, great job, you guys. I do see um, some correct answers. The answer is their tooth enamel contains iron, which makes them incredibly strong, sharp, and orange. The iron is oxidizing or rusting, and that's what makes the orange color. All right, good job, you guys. I'm gonna close the chat just for now, and then I will open it up as we have other questions. Um, so what is it about beavers that we are drawn to? I did ask everyone to think about it, but we're gonna go through some of the reasons right now. They're very social. They're very social animals, just like we are. They're monogamous, which means they mate for life. They're the largest members in the rodent family in North America. Um, the largest rodent in the world is called the capybara, but we don't have them in North America. They can be pretty difficult to study. They are a keystone species. Um, a keystone species is where other animals, other, um, other organisms, other wildlife in the ecosystem depend on beaver for survival. We are going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, the largest dam in the world, and uh, this is my, other, my next question for you guys. I'll open up the chat right now. I want to know if anyone can tell me um, how long in feet the longest beaver dam in the world is, the largest beaver dam in the world. Uh, this beaver dam is in Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, Canada. And I want to know if anyone can tell me how long it is in feet. And I can give you a hint, it can be seen from space. So I'll give you guys a couple, couple seconds to answer. Great guesses. Good guesses, I see 33 feet, 3,000, 4,000, 350 feet, 80 feet. Keep guessing, mile and a half, keep going. <laughs> Great guesses, you guys, I'm really excited. All right, all right, awesome guesses. I'm gonna give you the answer. It is 2,788 feet, visible from space, close to around, a little over a mile. Awesome, you guys. All right, I'm gonna close the chat just for now. Okay, beaver are also, they are deliberate planners and builders. They do have plans when they go um, build their lodges and their dams. They are adorable, of course, but they're also otherwise unlikely in the desert. People don't really think that beaver belong in the desert or really that they will be able to survive in the desert, but they're actually doing an amazing job. So talking about our beaver anatomy, they are very, very unique. They are semi-aquatic, which means they spend a lot of time underwater. They, um, they have a really unique tail as well. They have a big, fat, heavy tail that's usually used for swimming and as a rudder to help them steer while they're swimming in the water. But they also use it for balance and scaring away predators. Um, they can also use their tail to pat down um, globs of clay and mud on top of their dams and lodges. And when it comes to scaring away predators, they'll often slap it on top of the water to make a big, loud splash um, and that can often scare away predators. Um, they do have an insulating fur, which is, uh, it's sort of a double coat. Part of the coat is waterproof, oil heavy. The other part of that double coat is uh, for warmth. So it does have that really thick, fine fur. Um, and they do have webbed feet, again, really large back webbed feet to help them swim. They're actually great swimmers. And they also have a special respiratory system that lets them stay underwater for up to 15 minutes. So they don't even really have to breathe for that long. They can hold their breath for that long. They're active all year. They do not hibernate. 
and they have a really unique diet. Um, like I said, they are rodents and they have that typical rodent skull shape. And the picture that's up on the screen on the bottom right is a side view of what a rodent skull does look like. Um, you'll see the very front top and bottom teeth, and then you'll have that big space there. And then you'll have the, the molars in the back made for chewing. So they do have a unique diet. Um, I am going to open up the chat right here, and I want to see if you can tell me what the diet is of a beaver. So what do beaver eat? Let me open up the chat really quick. Okay, chat's open, go for it. So I wanna know um, what the diet is of a beaver. What do beaver eat? If you don't know, it's okay. That's why we're here, right? Awesome answers. I see roots, sap, trees, bark. Very specific, like riparian trees and shrubs, cottonwoods, willows. I love that answer. Grasses, moss, fish berries, trees. <laughs> Good guesses, you guys. I love it. Alrighty, I'm going to close the chat. Plants and flowers, beautiful. All right, chat's closed just for the time being. Their unique diet is strictly about 99% uh, wood. They do eat um, small flowering plants, the soft stuff, the new growth. So they really love uh, flowers, the tips of the trees, the really tender um, plants that are kind of new, but they will eat wood. They love the wood, specifically the outside underneath the bark. So in a tree, the very outside is the bark, the very outside. And then just underneath that bark is called a cork cambium. That's the, the really nice, juicy, soft stuff that beavers really love to, really love to eat. And that those very sharp teeth in the very front, like I said earlier, and uh, someone in the audience said too, they never stop growing, which is why they are constantly gnawing their teeth down. Uh, they use their teeth to gnaw down trees and to carry them back to uh, their lodges or their dams. Now the picture I have up on the screen is uh, sort of a funny comic that I just love. It's a beaver with a chainsaw for a hand and it says that natural selection does not grant what organisms need. It grants them what is useful. So their teeth are extremely useful. That's why beavers don't have chainsaws attached to their hands. That would be very useful, but it wouldn't, it's not practical. Okay, so beaver have traits much like our own. We sort of already talked about some of them. They do mate for life, they are monogamous. The number of babies that they have every year is directly related to the amount of resources they have. For example, if there's so much food and so much uh, room available to build and they have all this uh, resource available to build a family, to have a family, the number of babies they have will be high. However, if there's not a lot of food, if there's not very, very much growth that year, or if there's not enough room for them to have a family, then they may not, they may skip a year. Um, but can anyone tell me what a baby beaver is called? I will open up the chat for this. Can anyone tell me what a baby beaver is called? Okay, I see pup, kit, pup slash kit. <laughs> pup, it's okay if you don't know, totally okay, that's why we're here. They are adorable, that's absolutely right. In this picture, you can actually see the bottom feet and they are webbed. These little baby beaver are wet. Yeah, they're very cute. Uh, the answer is a kit. Baby beavers are called kits. They can live five to 10 years in the wild. Um, their dams are built specifically to store food. Um, and we're, we're gonna talk about a dam and a lodge and the differences in a little bit. Um, they're also built to keep their family safe from predators and from the weather and humans do the exact same thing. You know, we have a house with rooms and walls and it keeps us safe from predators. Um, if we had predators. Um, and it also keeps us safe from the weather. Uh, a colony or a family of two to 12 
is usually typical, and that's only parents and kids. It's not other families mixed together. Uh, a litter can be one to eight kits. So um, again, if there are a ton of resources, then the male and female may have up to eight kits. If there's not a lot of resources available, they may have as few as one or none for that year. Um, they do stock up on food for the winter. A lot of humans do that, and they stay inside during winter because the weather is so awful. They also build pathways and travel channels called slides to move food from one part of where they're living to another. So they're moving food and moving logs, which is really cool. Um, and then uh, a did you know fact, um, I wanna see if anyone in the audience can tell me when male kits leave the family and when female kits leave the colony or leave the family. And uh, my hint is they're different times. So the male kits will leave at a different point than the female kits. But the chat is open, I believe. Yep, it's open. Um, I kind of want to know if anyone can tell me when these little kits leave to start their own family. Good guesses. Good guesses. I see two years, one year, females one year, males two years, five years. So the male kits, oh, the male kits will leave the parent colony at 11 months, just under a year. And the female kits will leave at three years. And that is sort of adjustable. So if, again, if there are a ton of resources available, the kids may leave early. If there's not a ton of resources available, or if it's a dry year, a drought year, then they may stay a little longer, but that's typical. It is a big difference. Okay, I'm going to close the chat just for the time being. Great guesses, you guys. I love that everyone is participating. All right, next up, this is a home. This is a beaver lodge. Um, now, a lodge is very different from a dam, and they have different uses. And um, I'll, I'll talk about a, um, a dam in the next slide, I believe. So um, one more time, I do have a question for everybody. Uh, what triggers a beaver's urge to build a dam? Let me open up the chat really quick. Now, this was discovered pretty recently, and it's sort of hysterical, but what is it that um, specifically triggers a beaver's urge to build? Okay, I see enough food available, finding a mate mating season, the sound of running water, great guesses. Uh, running water moving fast, noises, they need to mate, beautiful guesses, I love it. <laughs> the answer is, um, it's the sound of running water that triggers a beaver's instincts. So uh, I did see a couple people get that right, that's great. So the way that they found this out is they went to a known location where there were a ton of beaver colonies and in the very middle of the road, on a dirt road, they planted a, uh, a radio, a tape recorder that would play back the sound of a rushing water or a waterfall. And over several days, beaver would come out of the woodwork and place um, small twigs and mud over the tape player. So it wasn't necessarily the water itself, it was simply just the sound of running water, which is pretty incredible. <laughs> Um, also kind of a neat study. Okay, I'm gonna close the chat just for the time being. We're gonna go through um, what makes up a beaver lodge. Now this is what they call home. So like I said earlier, a beaver lodge is separate from the dam. The dam itself is, the main purpose is to A, dam up the river or stream or water flow and to also have uh, food storage. And that's where they're, uh, they'll store a lot of the food. Um, Beaver also have an underwater entrance and exit. They typically have one of each. So they'll have an entrance, 
and they'll have an exit, just like a human home will typically have a front door and a back door. They have a feeding shelf, which could be considered the kitchen. Um, they'll usually gather food from the wood pile, enter the lodge and hang out on the feeding shelf and eat while they're safe away from predators. They'll spend the winter inside their lodge. They have multiple rooms, so they, they will have a feeding shelf or a kitchen, but they'll also have a living room, a nursery for kids. They'll also have a mud room. A mud room can be um, an entrance, a small entrance room where a beaver can dry off, shake off any mud before entering the rest of the lodge. And um, some human homes will have those. Um, mud is also plastered on the outside. They can use their tail for that. It also holds the lodge together and provides home for other wildlife. A lot of birds depend on this, rodents depend on this. Um, they'll also have in the very center or close to the center. I don't know if you can see from this drawing, but there's a, a vent to let out all that heat that the animals are creating from inside the lodge so that it all doesn't get trapped in there. So there is a little bit of an escape. So this is an example of a home. Now you can't see a lot of what we talked about, but this is just what the outside looks like. And this is an example of where there, where there will be a dam with food storage, and then their lodge with an entrance and exit, multiple rooms, and then there will be a separate food pile. Now the dam can also be used as food storage. Some colonies will also have a smaller area off to the side where they will um, collect food from. So that food storage um, on the right hand side there of that drawing, that's sometimes optional. So beaver do have a lot of really positive impacts that we kind of have to manage. Beavers can help us restore the streams and the way they flow. Um, so in this example on the screen, there are two dams that were very recently built. There's a lot of dead plant life, over time, those, um, those beaver dams can extend across and all of that plant life will start to come back. And over a long period of time, um, it can create sort of a makeshift wetlands. Um, they can also fix erosion and build up ponds. And again, a lot of other wildlife depend on this. We talked about birds and rodents, but also fish. You know, fish depend on all this too, insects, all of that. In terms of a drought area where there are a lot of dead plant life, but also like the, the, the river is winding down, it's sort of drying up. Beaver can also change the flow of the water and again, build up into what sort of a, a makeshift wetlands. And they really do an, a, a, an aggressive, amazing job. They can improve the vegetation, the diversity of the vegetation, um, changing the flow of water, we did talk about that and they can provide a slight flooding that can be seasonal. You know, they can build up dams, break down dams, depending on what they're looking for, what the food is like, what the resources are like, and they're always creating habitat. So in terms of searching for evidence of beaver, they do leave behind some telltale signs. They can leave behind freshly cut trees, shrubs. They do munch on flowers occasionally. You will see dams and lodges. Um, and tracks. These are fun to look for, especially near um, where the riverbanks are or where there's sand or mud. Now on the screen, it shows the webbed back foot. They're around six inches long. And when they walk, they walk and they waddle at the same time. So their back feet will often cover up their front feet tracks. Um, they do live behind piles of wood chips when they're carving away to, to chop down a tree. They, they do have food channels or slides to transport food from one area to another. We did talk about that. And they have food storage sites, droppings or scat. They're really hard to find. In fact, I couldn't find a very um, obvious picture, so I don't have one of those for you guys, but they do leave behind droppings, of course. And because of all these things, beaver can be difficult to study. but you guys are going to become the biologists just for a little bit. I am going to open up the chat for this entire activity. Let me do this really quick. Okay, so I have that up so I can see it. 
Now, um, my challenge for you guys, the chat is open. Um, I want you to look at the pictures. I'm going to show you a series of pictures and I want you to see if you can tell me which is a sign of beaver and which is a sign of uh, natural occurrence or even humans. And then I'll give you the answers regardless. Alrighty. So this is the first one. Um, can you tell me which is a sign of beaver and which is a sign of no beaver? Some of these are pretty obvious. Some of them are not. Um, but I want you to look hard. We did talk about some of those signs. I do see some answers coming in. Interesting. A lot of people are saying that it is the one on the right. All right. The answer is the one on the left. <laughs> um, the reason how you can tell is because um, beaver are leaving behind wood chips. So on the right hand side of the left picture, you'll see a very small pile of white colored wood chips. That's from the beaver gnawing away on this log to chop it down. Now the one on the right, this is a, a very natural occurrence. You'll see um, it was actually chopped down by an ax. Now that isn't the giveaway. The giveaway here is that the bark is falling off the tree naturally and that um, that happens after a tree is felled or falls on its own or grubs go in there and eat away and it rots it, it just happens okay next can you tell me is it the left or the right i'm looking at the chat All right, everyone is saying the right. Yes, it is the right. Uh, that is a beaver lodge, not a dam. Um, you can tell because there's really no uh, flowing. There's really no blocking of any water. There's no flowing of any water and there's geese sitting on top of it. They're probably using that very center vent as a nest, which is really typical. Good job, you guys. Okay, next. Okay, I, I see some are seeing the left, some are seeing the right. Looks like it's pretty split down the middle. I changed my mind, everything is, everyone is seeing the left. The answer is the right. <laughs> this is a great example of a beaver slide or a transport tunnel. So um, as we kind of talked about earlier, beaver are moving logs, they're moving food from one area to another. And these are pretty tiny. Um, this one in particular is less than a foot across in width. The one on the right, if you really look closely, you can see boot prints from humans. All kind of where it's muddy, you can see some um, boot prints. So some of these are tough. Some of the, you guys are doing really great though. Okay, next, this one should be, Pretty easy, hopefully. These are tracks. So which is from a beaver and which is from not a beaver? All right, answers are coming in. Everyone is saying the right, that's correct. This is the back foot of the webbed foot. Great job. This one hopefully should be easy as well. Answers are coming in. Everyone is seeing the left. That's absolutely right. Um, this one is the beaver. You can see some chipping right here um, in the center where the tree is still standing at the base. And then you can see some chips kind of hanging out on the side there. Now the one on the right, that is from humans. Um, there's not a lot of obvious chips. An axe will typically leave two or three large cuts. And that's what we see here. A beaver also won't cut down um, a whole bunch of trees in one single area. They'll typically take down a tree in one small area and then move to another area to chop down a, another tree. So they won't clear cut like humans will. Okay, 
Okay, is this the left or the right? Some answers are coming in. Everyone is seeing it's the right. Great job, it is. This is a lodge or the beginning of a lodge. It's kind of hard to see, but um, if you look at the very center of the picture, you can see a lot of um, branches laying down in the same direction. That's a great telltale sign. And it's on the side of a riverbank. Now the top is from a bird. This is called a bower bird. And they do build little huts. They do decorate as well, which is really interesting. We don't have bower birds in North America, but it was a, a great comparison. I wanted to see if anyone could catch it. Okay, just a few more. I'm gonna give everyone just a couple seconds. This one's kind of tough. I see mixed, I see, it looks like half of you are saying the left and half of you are saying the right. Now, this, is, this one was very difficult only because the picture on the right there's not really anything to tell you what the scale is and how big these animals are, but it is the one on the left. Um, the telltale sign is the shape of the head and the little ear that you can see swimming. And this beaver is pulling um, branches and twigs behind him or her. The one on the right, these are actually muskrat. So they are pretty small, but um, I wanted to see if anyone would catch that telltale sign of the beaver dragging branches behind it. Just a couple more. Just a few seconds. Yes, excellent. I see interest coming in. Yeah, the one on the left. This is the one on the left. Um, that is a dam. You can see that there is water pooling up behind the dam and then there's uh, a, just a little bit of water coming through the, the dam itself. Now the one on the right that is just a natural occurrence that's just erosion and I believe this is the last one. You guys are getting good. I see a lot of left answers. It is the one on the left. Um, pretty, pretty obvious if you really look close. I do see a lot of chips hanging out around the base of the tree. And when beaver eat at the base of a tree, they're actually carving away a little bit at a time. So if you really look at the upper part of the stalk of the tree, the, not the stalk, <laughs> the trunk of the tree, you can see pieces are carved away. Whereas on the picture on the right, it looks like an ax got to it. An ax will typically leave one or two or three main cuts. Great job. Okay, I was wrong. Maybe this is the last one. You guys are getting good. I'm very impressed. I see a lot of right. I also see a lot of left. The answer is the right one. This is one of those uh, slides or travel channels for food. The one on the left, this picture on the left here, that's just a river or a small stream. Um, the, the angle of it may look a little, a little strange, but um, on the right here, the water looks stagnant. It's not flowing. So beaver, it looks like that they're traveling along this pretty frequently for it to be that deep and dug in. Excellent job, you guys. Great job. I'm really impressed. Everyone did an amazing job. I'm going to close the chat just for the time being. Okay, so now that we've looked at signs of beaver, you guys practiced your skills. We're going to inspect their homes just a little bit further. So beaver are so successful, um, especially in North America. So I did pull up a map. This is a map of North America. Now the green is the typical range of where we can find beaver. But if you really look, uh, the state of Nevada is, does not have a lot of green in it. And I put a circle that says you are here. So we're covering the entire state today. They do serve a very specific niche. Um, beaver 
are providing something for that ecosystem, for that environment. They're providing homes, they're providing habitat for so many different species, species that depend on them for that. There are no other, um, no other animals that really provide that sort of service, if you will, for that ecosystem. There really aren't any known predators. I'm sure any other animals could attack them, could prey on them. However, beavers have that remarkable ability to go underwater and stay there for 15 minutes. They, they can hide out in their lodges. They, they have that, that food storage, so they don't have to travel very far if they don't need to. So they don't have a lot of known predators. Kids can travel miles to create new colonies, to start their own families. When the time comes, they can travel miles and miles just to start their, their new family. And if they don't find a mate right away, they can live solo for quite a few years. Um, they do serve as a keystone species. We kind of talked about this. This is a picture. I love this picture. It is um, a beaver dam that is in the process. It's sort of new. So what's really unique about beaver dams is that they, one, create wetlands and habitat for other species, but their dams are unique in that they block about 90% of the water flow. They'd still let some of that water flow through. They're not blocking 100%. They're not, they're not, um, yeah, they're not blocking all of the water. Next to humans, no other animal appears to shape the landscape quite like this in a very short period of time. Other than building homes and buildings and such, um, beaver are really doing positive work here. And I also love this picture too. If you really look, there are several dams just in this picture that are creating um, water to flow out and um, out and around. So instead of water flowing just a single direction and causing erosion, this picture shows that um, all these beaver dams can create sort of a fan of water. And lastly, um, they, beavers have a, a, an amazing ability to um, impact climate change. They really are managing their little area right where they live and combating negative human impact. So for example, if, uh, if they fell a ton of trees in one particular area, if humans do this, beaver can come in and remove those trees. They can build a dam or a lodge out of it. If trash is left behind, they can remove the trash, make it part of their dam. I am not saying that you should leave trash behind, but it is um, possible for them to do that. If there's a drought, they can build up the habitat and make water flow in a very specific way. So beaver are so successful. They build homes along washes and lakes. They're great at finding these very specific little areas where it's needed. They're, they don't have a lot of predators, which is why they're so great at thriving throughout the state, which is, which is great because we would never really think of beaver living here. Um, and they're really great at communicating with each other. They're able to tell each other where food is, where the predators might be if there are any around and if there's danger near. So this is a challenge that I present to you as your family living at home um, and staying home for Nevada. My challenge is I want you to play a very quick game of charades. Not during the presentation, maybe after, but this could be extended as well. So I want you to tell your family without speaking that there's food nearby, there's a predator getting close, time to hide, time to play, time to get to work. This is my area, go find your own space to build your home. And there are humans coming, stay quiet. So beaver don't really have um, a voice the way humans do in that we can speak and we have a language and we talk to each other. Beaver do have a call. <laughs> it's a very high pitched squeak but it doesn't say much. A lot of beaver will communicate just using their body language. Um, we talked about hiding. We talked about slapping their tail on the water, slapping their tail on their dams to um, 
obviously pat down some mud and some dirt, but also, you know, this might also scare away predators. So beaver have a great way to communicate with each other and to other animals without having that clear language, that without having that clear voice. Their language is body language. So my challenge to you is to say all these things, maybe more if you have time, uh, with your family, with your friends while staying home for Nevada. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna progress through the presentation, but this can be something that anyone can do on their own time, and there could be more. Okay, so thinking ahead, um, we do have ways to live with beaver to help protect them and also to protect the environment. You know, we don't want them chopping down all of the trees, all of the bushes. So what we've done is we've taken some of the older growth trees that we really enjoy and then some of the newer growth trees that we want to become established and we put uh, fencing around them just around the base so that beaver can't gnaw them down. Um, and the fencing doesn't hurt the tree, doesn't hurt the beaver, it doesn't hurt any of the other wildlife. So it really is a win-win. We do protect very specific areas. Um, and we also want to prevent disturbance of lodges. So if you do see a lodge or a dam, don't touch them. The best thing to do is to just take a picture, you know, give the space that's um, needed for beaver, you know, respect their own space. Education and awareness, you know, this is part of it. So my challenge to you on top of communicating with everyone is um, tell your friends about what you learn, tell your family about what you learn, look for signs of beaver that you maybe didn't notice before. Um, and think about resources. So, um, you know, beaver have the ability to look at what resources are available and maybe not have babies that year or move to a new area, change their landscape. You know, they have this really great relationship with the environment where they live. But it is always possible that beaver can sort of um, have too many babies on accident and, you know, they need a place to go. They need a place to live. So it's up to us to think about um, where they are living and we don't want them to become overpopulated. So I have a question for you guys. Let me open up the chat. Okay. Um, my question for you, and it kind of relates to the, uh, the picture on the right hand side here. Beaver once traveled by parachute because this happened. They, they did overpopulate the area where they were living. They were chopping down too many trees. And it came to a point where um, the maintenance guys, the people who were working in that park, couldn't keep up with all of the damage that the beaver were doing. So they trapped some and safely parachuted them to another area where they could live so that they could help that environment. So my question to you is what year did this happen? The chat is open. I do see some answers coming through. 2012. 1978, 2000, great answers, keep them coming. Uh, while the answers are coming in, I will tell you that the, the project was extremely successful and uh, it is always possible that this sort of thing may happen again. It's just something that we have to think about. It's just a fun, a fun story. I see you taking clues from the picture. Someone mentioned the truck. All right, great answers. The answer was um, 1948 by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. This is a picture of some of the beavers landing. So what they did was they built very, um, very safe padded um, trunks boxes with old parachutes and they very uh, very carefully let the parachutes go with the boxes attached and the beaver attached and the beaver could use the wood from the boxes to start building their dam and they had something to eat while they were there. So the, um, the project itself was extremely successful, a really fun thing that the Idaho Department of Fish and Game did in 1948. The study continued to follow the population up until the mid-1950s. It's a very fun thing to learn about. 
Okay, I'm going to close the chat just for a second. Um, so what can we do? Of course, we always want to think about the wildlife in our area. They're so important to us. We, all, we always want to admire from a distance binoculars, cameras. Um, respecting wildlife space is extremely important because they need that space to survive. Um, respect the wetlands, respect the wildlife. Um, stay on established trails. Don't really establish your own. The trails are there for a reason. Take out what you bring in, you know, never leave any trash and never ever feed wildlife. Um, we never want to feed wildlife for a lot of different reasons. This is my very last question to you guys. I'm going to open up the chat one last time. Um, okay, I want you to tell me why we should never feed wildlife, ever. On accident or on purpose, because we can feed them on accident by leaving pet food out or not putting your trash away appropriately. So the chat's open. Wow, a lot of great answers. I see it may make them depend on humans for food. They may lose their instincts. They get used to it. They could get sick, absolutely. They could get aggressive, absolutely. They could get hurt by leading them to humans. They don't, they don't overpopulate. Yes, absolutely. Great answers, everybody. Um, yes, wildlife is perfectly capable of finding food on their own. They don't need humans for help. Um, we never want to feed wildlife because we don't want them to get used to it. We don't want, we don't want to humanize them. Wildlife should stay wild. We, human food can make them sick. It can cause problems in the environment. It can clog up waterways. It can smell bad. It can cause bacteria infections. It can cause infections in the animals themselves. Um, they can get aggressive if they get used to it and then they don't get the food that they are expecting. I have seen animals beg for food. Um, no matter how cute they are, we never want to feed wildlife. We want to keep them wild, absolutely. We don't want them to, to depend on us. Um, yeah, we don't want to, yeah, it can also share disease. They have their own diet. Excellent answers, everybody. Okay, so um, last but not least, um, I know that Nicole has been doing an amazing job answering questions. So I am going to open up the question and answer box myself just to see if there were any questions that we didn't get to. Okay. Wow, great questions, everybody. Um, okay, so the very first the the very first question I would like to answer says, uh, we saw beaver returning to Lake Tahoe. Were they brought there or where did they come from? That is a great question. I actually can't tell you whether the beaver you saw um, were brought there. Probably not. The most likely answer is that the beaver were not brought there at all. Like I said, kids can travel miles and miles to start their own colony, but beaver also don't really uh, migrate. So what you are probably seeing were beaver um, that were just coming out, um, making sure that their lodges were okay, building a new lodge, building a new dam, working on their dam. Maybe it was a, a kit from a new family or a new colony um, establishing their own. Um, so they probably traveled up the river. That's usually how they travel up the river, looking for listening for that flowing water to start building their own dam. Um, the next question is, can you feed them wood? Um, great question. Even though they do eat wood, it's about 99% of their diet, it's never a good idea to feed them yourself. Um, they are perfectly capable of traveling miles to get the food they need and um, to find the, the the food that they need, which is wood. So yeah, we should never feed the wildlife. When is the best time to see them? Great answer. I actually didn't talk about that at all and I apologize. Um, beaver are uh, usually seen dusk and dawn. 
They are not nocturnal or diurnal, which means you're awake during the day. They're called crepuscular, which is dawn and dusk. So um, the best time to see them is so early in the morning, right before the sun comes up and right after the sun goes down. Do their lodges flood and how do they get their food if they do flood? That's a great question, Karen. Um, the answer is sure. I mean, flooding is a thing. It's, it's, a, it's a natural disaster, especially in Nevada, it happens a lot. Um, beaver are constantly rebuilding, patching, tearing down, fixing, adjusting, um, building new lodges, building new dams. So it's always possible that their rivers that they've already blocked up, their dams, their lodges, their food piles could flood out. But beaver are pretty resilient. You know, they, they don't have to build in order to find food. Their main priority is to find food. But, and when they have enough food, then they will build, then they will fix things. So it's always possible that their uh, lodges and dams could flood. And then the last question says, or one of the last questions says, how do they find a mate if all their, with all their family around them? That's a great question too. So what normally happens is how they find a mate when it's time for the male and female kits to leave, they will start wandering on their own and potentially find a mate right away, or they can start building, um, their own little colony without another beaver. Um, you know, they can travel miles and miles to find their own place to establish a colony and another beaver may find them. They do travel during the day. They just have to be lucky and listening and uh, finding each other. I hope I answered that correctly. <laughs> I mean, I hope I answered that clearly. And then the very last question, what is the latest family colonies of beaver? I'm not sure I understand that question, but what I think you mean is what is the largest family or colony of beaver? Um, the answer is, you know, uh, typically the number of kits in a litter is between one and eight. Eight is on that higher range. So the largest would typically be around 10, you know, mom and dad, and then plus that eight, which is a large litter, which is 10. All right. Uh, one last question I saw pop up. Um, I'm, I'm making sure I understand it before I read it, before I, before I answer it. Um, the question is, can the mate kill the old babies like whales? Now, what I think you're, what I think you're talking about is if a beaver finds a new mate and the old kits are still there from the previous mate, um, beaver will typically mate for life. Um, they are, um, so they're, they're not really ever looking for a brand new mate. So if for whatever reason their mate dies, which would be very sad, but it is part of nature, they really won't find another mate until all of those kits are gone and they've left and they've, they've um, started their own colonies. Great, there's so many questions. <laughs> Okay, I do see the, so here's the question. So um, why do they only have teeth sticking out from the very front and why do they only eat trees? Um, so that's a two-parter. They have teeth in the very front. Those are their gnawing teeth and that's how they chop down wood. They're always growing. So they're always gnawing on something to either eat or build up their lodges or their dams. That's why they're orange. That's why they're so strong. Those are those teeth that they use to chop down trees. And why do they eat trees? If I could ask a beaver a question, that might be it. 
Um, beaver do have a really unique diet of only trees. It does work for them. It, they do get all of the nutrients they need. It does make up a huge majority of their diet, but they do get everything they need from eating trees. And they don't eat the hardest part of the tree that they use that part to build their lodges and their dams. They typically will eat the soft new growth of a tree, like uh, the new saplings or flowers. Okay, great. I think you guys have awesome questions. Um, okay, this question, will a mom have more kits with one or two kits still at home? The answer is yes, they could have kits every single year but it still is that one single family. And a colony is a family. Um, a colony or family could be mom and dad plus their kids, but they, they won't overstep. They typically will not overstep all their resources. So let's say a male and a female have eight kids, which is a lot. And there were plenty of resources that year. The following year, if there are not as many resources, and only one or two of the kits were males, they've left, they will usually leave within a year. Mom and dad from that original family colony may only have one or two kits, depending on what resources are available. Okay, I believe I've answered all the questions. Um, I really do want to thank everyone for participating, for tuning in. This was one of my favorite topics. It's a lot of fun um, to have people participate with me, even though we are live, we are virtual. Um, it is a little bit different, but it's a lot of fun. I hope you guys learned something. Um, all of the webinars after the recording is over can be found on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can watch this at any time. But thank you so much for staying safe, staying home for Nevada. Thank you so much for tuning in and I really appreciate it. Um, since all the questions were, oh, oh man. Oh yeah, all the questions were answered. <laughs> I see a lot of thank yous, thank you. I so much appreciate it. You guys have a wonderful day and hopefully we will see you at the next webinar, whatever that topic might be. It might be amazing. It will be amazing. Thank you guys.